Now here's a game with a colorful history despite its monochromatic title, Black and White. Developed by Lionhead Studios and published by Electronic Arts for Windows PCs in 2001 and later for Mac OS in 2002. And in the early 2000s PC gaming world, few titles were more hyped up than this one, being the first game from the newly formed Lionhead Studios. Not only was Black and White the debut title from the ex-Bullfrog developers since they'd gone independent, but it had been in the works for over three years by the time it came out. Back then, that was an unusually long development cycle, and originally Lionhead expected to have it done by Q4 of 1999. But release estimates came and went, excitement grew and dwindled, and every six months or so the cycle would repeat with some new interview promoting the project and its larger-than-life designer Peter Molyneux. Make no mistake, the game looked insanely cool all the way from its announcement in 1998 to its eventual release in 2001. Teaser footage made it seem like a successor to Bullfrog classics like Populous and Dungeon Keeper. Its graphical detail was unprecedented at the time, and the promise of cutting-edge artificial intelligence with trainable creatures sounded amazing. Then it came out, as such a buggy mess that some folks thought they might have shipped a beta version instead of the finished game, and when it did work, some still felt it didn't meet their lofty expectations despite favorable reviews in the gaming press. That being said, though, I find Black and White more than intriguing enough to revisit. It's just filled with so many unusual choices. Even the box is a unique choice, with dual gatefold covers showing off the white and black moral paths the game was known for. It's a cliché at this point, considering how many games have gone down this route, with evil choices adding horns and spikes to everything, and good choices means butterflies and rainbows. But yeah, it was a neat idea at the time, enough to make me grab a copy in the early 2000s. Opening up the box, you got the game itself on CD-ROM inside this minimally decorated cardboard sleeve, a product registration card, and this 16-page installation guide covering the excitement of troubleshooting everything from Windows 95 to Millennium Edition. Finally, there's the manual, printed appropriately enough in black and white. It covers a lot of ground, with 52 pages worth of densely packed information throwing everything at you all at once. Due to the way the campaign is structured, I recommend using this as more of a reference guide after you've started playing. Black and White begins with a white and black logo, followed by a black and white logo, and culminating in what amounts to a teaser for Black and White itself. No real information or lore is provided, just a minute and a half of random gameplay footage. And it only plays the first time you start the game, too, making its inclusion that much more questionable. Once it's done showing off its press kit sizzle reel, it's time to give yourself a name and choose a pre-made symbol, the latter of which will become the defining imagery of your religion. Once you've established your impending godhood, a short cutscene plays setting up the world of Eden and your place within it. By which I mean you have no place at all until the precise moment that you do. A land of innocence has no need for gods. Until fate intervenes. Keep away hey, from wait, the water! Stop! When people pray, a god is always born. Help! Someone help, help us! Our child. We call Please. to the heavens! Able to change eternity. That god is you. Yeah, this intro still really gets me in the mood for some god gaming. That awesome music by Russell Shaw and trippy cosmic imagery, dude, something about it just gives me chills. Are you a blessing or a curse? Good or evil? Be what you will, you are destiny. You saved our boy! Thank you! Thank you for your mercy! We praise you! Greetings! We're your conscience! Good and evil! Yin and Yang! Black and white! As part of you, we'll guide you through this world! How to move? 
let's see. You move your hand in the direction you want to travel like this. And then just like that, it's a clunky old computer game. <laughs> yeah, get ready for tons of mandatory hand-holding and unskippable tutorials, which granted at the time were still a fresh idea, and if you've never played before, it's a solid tutorial, especially since the manual leaves something to be desired and explaining things clearly. However, if you have played before and simply want to start a new game, then this tutorial is a real slog, and the option to skip it would have been nice. Fans eventually patched this whole section out themselves, but more on that later. For now though, let's follow along and see how vanilla black and white works, because even to this day I've never played anything quite like it. You move the hand to the side of the screen until the rotate arrow appears like this. You hold down the move button. Then you move the hand in a circular motion to rotate around and see things from a different angle. So yeah, the basic idea is that you play a supernatural deity represented by a hand floating around the landscape. You've got two advisors representing the good and evil sides of your conscience, and who keep you informed of your godly options whenever big notable choices pop up. And there are a number of nearby human villagers that have started believing in your existence, so your overarching goal is to increase their belief in you by manipulating the world using your god hand and a selection of miracles. But, uh, the controls are a thing. Black and White lacks a traditional user interface, and alternatively went with a mouse-driven layer of abstraction. Instead of windows, icons, and drop-down menus, you've got this floating hand of God and the world around it. Everything is designed to be controlled using your hand and a combination of mouse movements, audio and video cues, and context-sensitive objects. Left mouse button moves around the map, right mouse button interacts with things, and combining the two buttons controls the camera. That is, if you're using a mouse at all. Essential Reality teamed up with Lionhead to provide native P5 glove support in 2002, stating it was the perfect gaming platform to demonstrate the power and technical achievement of the new P5T technology. If you've seen my Oddware episode all about this device, I'm sure you'll react to that statement with a fair bit of skepticism. As with most P5 experiences, it's not that it doesn't work at all, it's that it works just enough to become more frustrating than if you weren't using it to begin with. Obviously, seeing as the whole game is played with a virtual hand, it makes some sense to implement a virtual hand controller, and as a result, it does function better than other P5 demonstrations I showed on Oddware, but come on now! This game is weird enough on its own. No need to throw an infrared finger mouse into the mix. Faith in you has fallen like a stone. You don't say. Regardless of wonky glove controllers, though, Lionhead was deeply committed to the whole disembodied god hand idea in black and white, making sure players rarely did anything other than click and drag, almost never having to touch the keyboard. Not that I recommend playing like that, since there's a bunch of shortcuts that are only accessible through the keyboard, many of which the tutorial never mentions. For example, you're told that saving and loading the game occurs inside your temple, so you'd navigate to the building in world, right-click it to go inside, enter the main central room, navigate to the save room on the right, then click on a picture to zoom into it, type in a title to save your game, then exit the save room and leave the temple to return to the game. Or you could just press Control s on the keyboard and quick save at any time. I know which method I prefer. There's tons of stuff like this that seems needlessly cumbersome, implemented under the guise of immersion and innovation. But then you dig a little deeper and it turns out there's actually an easier and more efficient way of doing things. Like how there are unseen controls to slow down and speed up time by pressing Alt-1 and 2 on the keyboard. Or how you can forgo the bizarre screen edge camera controls if you simply use a mouse with a clickable wheel. Anyway, all that to say that black and white is often simpler to play than it appears at first glance. And thank goodness, because what's here is immediately captivating. At least to me as a fan of the god game and city builder subgenres. Despite what Lionhead said in the marketing, black and white is less of a role playing game and more of a real time strategy game with an emphasis on resource management and puzzle solving. We're not keen on sinking, so we're all sitting here thinking Cause we built it too big and we've run out of wood Idle idly, idle idly We simply can't leave till we get some more wood Each of the five main maps in the campaign contain their own sets of challenges to complete, signified by golden scrolls indicating story objectives, and silver scrolls providing side quests. 
but the core gameplay revolves around accumulating the resources of food, wood, belief, and villagers. Food and wood are pretty self-explanatory, acquired by villagers or by picking them up yourself. Belief is gained by performing miraculous actions within the view of villagers, and naturally, villagers themselves are acquired by reproduction for the most part, as well as converting them away from rival gods to believe in you instead. Overall, it's a pretty laid-back experience, lording over the land as your people go about their day working, dancing, worshipping, screwing, building, eating, and complaining. Ah, it's nice. Too bad there's a bunch of nonsense constantly screwing things up. For one thing, villagers often have questionable priorities. So if you don't want them wandering around doing whatever, generate some disciples by dropping people down near specific objects and structures. Disciple Forester. This is how you create dedicated builders, farmers, woodcutters, fishermen, craftsmen, and even breeders, all doing little more than eat, sleep, and work. This is also one method of increasing your influence by creating missionaries and traders to nearby villages. Influence is shown by these wavy colored borders when you zoom out, and there's a whole stack of variables affecting how quickly and how far it spreads. And even then, it's not so much a hard border as it is a loose indicator of your power. Like, you can still reach beyond your own influence to manipulate people and objects outside of your own lands, but only for a limited time. And then you have to go back and try again to refresh your hand. It's a bizarre mechanic at first, where you're constantly moving your god hand in and out of rival territory, but you get used to it. Tossing rocks and trees and things from a distance is also an option, as well as performing miracles. With good-natured miracles like generating food in forests, and offensive ones like tossing out fireballs and lightning. Another way to influence villagers is the creature, a large animal with divine powers that you'll choose while playing the first tutorial island. There are three creatures on offer by default, that being the ape, the cow, and the tiger. However, there are eight more creatures out there in the world to be unlocked, as well as four DLC creatures. Ah, 2001, when downloadable content came in the form of self-extracting executables found on the developer's website. For free, even! My how things change. Anyway, creatures! They're big and powerful, but not too big and powerful, at least not yet. Each one has to be fed, exercised, trained, played with, and scolded in order to increase their capabilities and size. And as with everything else in the game, this means using your god hand, so you can hand them food, bring them toys, rub them nicely when they do something you want, or give them a good smacking if they do something you don't. Seems harsh, but it's the only way to get them to learn to not take unholy craps in the middle of town, or pick up and eat random worshippers, or whatever else you deem unsuitable. You can also train creatures using leashes, making sure that they only hang out around certain areas and witness you doing certain things. Because yeah, they learn by exposure to your godly activities, eventually figuring out how to perform many of the same actions and miracles. Creatures also carry over into skirmish mode too, so you're not limited to training them during the campaign maps. There are three of these skirmish maps that you can enter at any time, where you'll compete with between one to three AI gods, or the same number of human players over a LAN or the internet. At least before EA shut down the online servers, of course, so playing against AI is the best bet, unless you use a custom multiplayer client. But yeah, creature training is key to surviving the later parts of the game, and thankfully they do have a separate moral alignment from yours, so they can go around being a jerk while you play a pacifist or vice versa. Powerful stuff when used to your advantage. This also means that you'll likely attract the attention of other gods and their creatures, which can lead to a battle. Unfortunately, actually controlling fights is not very engaging. It's less direct and more like you're coaching from the sidelines, clicking nearby to say when to attack, dodge, and defend. You can also perform a couple of miracles to help turn the tide, but the delayed actions and camera swooping around the action makes this difficult, especially since these miracles rely on gestures. Oh uh, yeah, that's a thing. Performing miracles means performing gestures, accomplished by drawing shapes on the ground with the mouse. Again, eschewing keyboard usage and menu systems, miracles are selected either by clicking miracle generators or by drawing their symbol. And, well, it kinda works. 
Most of the shapes are easily repeated, but some of them are strangely picky with how they're drawn, so it's far easier to navigate back into town to choose them directly. As for gaining miracle access to begin with, there are two main methods of doing that. Raising this statue in your village center will ring bells telling your villagers it's time to worship, and a percentage of them will follow suit depending on how high you raise it. This causes a big ol' worship party outside your temple, continuing until you call it off. Meaning villagers can pray themselves to death if you're not paying attention, but yeah, each village provides access to specific miracles. So the more villages you have, the more miracles you can perform. And the longer villagers worship, the more prayer power you have to perform miracles. Or you can instead drop living sacrifices onto the altar with older villagers providing a little power and the youngest ones being the most effective. <laughs> So, um, killing babies, it's a legit strategy. The other method of miracle making is completely untied to belief and results from bursting these one-shot miracle bubbles to provide access to a single instance of said miracle. Simple, straightforward, no need for infanticide. And absolutely necessary on the later maps. And while there are only five maps and the first one is an absolute breeze to play, don't be fooled by the false sense of security. Black and White soon stops playing around, and before you know it, you're being struck down by far older, angrier, and more powerful gods than you. That first island map is seriously just a tutorial. Even after it appears, the tutorial's ended. Map 2 is where the game first opens up and has you making real choices, like creating new buildings by constructing wooden scaffolding, combining them up to seven times, and plopping them down wherever you like. This is also where you have to start worrying about villager desires, like offspring, civic buildings, and general expansion. And silver scrolls start becoming more important, providing opportunities to earn vital resources and miracles that'll make completing the current map more feasible. And then there's Map 3, which is where Black and White finally starts to get real. A rival god captures your creature and tosses you onto an uninhabited section of the map with almost nothing, whereas he already has a temple and multiple thriving villages that are quickly taking over everything. And each time you take over one of those villages, you're smited with some kind of disaster, like humans he sets on fire that frantically run towards your own tinderbox of a village, and a bloodthirsty wolf pack darting towards your followers ready for an easy meal. Eventually you reach level 4, where the island's cursed by constant thunderstorms and fireballs and the sky is blood red making everyone depressed and oh god. Anyway, yeah, by the time I reached the fifth and final level, I was more than ready for the game to just end. But not Lionhead. Before its eventual sequel came along, they released the Creature Isle expansion pack in January of 2002. And it's kind of an odd choice for an expansion, but at this point I'd expect nothing less from this odd game. Instead of providing a new campaign or something, it instead focuses on expanding creature options, taking place entirely on the new map of Creature Isle. New creatures are introduced, including a chicken, a crocodile, and a rhinoceros. And there's a number of new additions related to creature raising, the central goal of completing a sequence of trials for a group of former godly minions called the Brotherhood of Creatures. Eh, you know, it's fun enough, it's fine, but something I can go without. Not that I don't recommend it at all, only that I find its new additions to be skippable in the grand scheme of things. And there you have it, that's Black and White. An enchanting experience that I find equal parts fascinating and frustrating. Awesome and awkward, impressive and imperfect. It sure is a Peter Molyneux game, maybe the Molyneuxest game of them all, and the resulting quirkiness is perhaps why it's held onto a group of vocal fans all this time no matter how difficult it becomes to play it on modern systems. And ugh, this is one hard-to-run game on newer hardware. I've been playing this on my Windows XP build throughout this video, but there's a whole slew of compatibility options, fan-made patches, and safe disk DRM cracks to get it working on PCs running Windows Vista and higher. Either way, I do recommend giving Black and White a try sometime if you haven't, and you're into real-time god game strangeness or if you just like slapping virtual cows. If you like this video, then maybe you'd like some of the other things I've done. I cover old PC games, retro hardware, and all sorts of classic computery stuff each week. As always, though, thank you very much for watching what you just did.